Good evening, members of council, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, staff. I see that we have quorum, and I call this regular meeting for the town of Pelham Council for Tuesday, August 4th, 2015, to order. We will begin with the singing of the national anthem. Uh, led by Councillor Papp, and I would ask all who are able to rise. Oh, Canada, our home and native land, true patriot love in all thy sons command. With glowing hearts we see thee rise, the true north strong and free. From far and wide, O Canada, we stand on guard for thee. God, keep our land glorious and free. O Canada, we stand on guard for thee. O Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Thank you, Councillor Papp. Thank you all. Before we uh, begin the agenda, the formal part of the evening and, and approve that agenda, I'd like uh, the uh, CAO to welcome our new Director of Planning, Mr. CAO. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm pleased to uh, introduce Barb Weens to uh, the senior management team uh, with the town. Uh, Barb is a well-recognized planner uh, in the Niagara region and uh, throughout Ontario. Uh, she's got uh, a ton of um, municipal experience, notably a long stint in Niagara on the Lake, where she served as the uh, director of planning for about a decade. And she comes to us most re recently as a full partner of Portech Group, a uh, private sector consulting firm. Uh, so um, Barb brings with her a wealth of experience, both in the private and the public sector. Um, and she comes to us with a uh, absolutely fantastic uh, reputation and highly recommended. Uh, actually received a number of calls from the, from the development community uh, indicating how excited they were to hear that she was coming and uh, uh, they were excited to, uh, to be able to work with her with uh, the various projects that are going on in the community. So it's a thrill to have her on board and uh, I'd like to introduce Barb. Thank you very much. Thank Pleasure. you. Thank you for joining us this evening, Ms. Weens, on your first day today. <laughs> and uh, we're starting with a council meeting, but uh, so pleased that you're part of our team. Thank you. Thank you. We'll, we'll try and be easy on the questions <laughs> this meeting, but maybe next time we'll We'll have a few. I'll be ready next time. <laughs> Thank you very much and welcome. Now we move to approval of the agenda. It has been moved by Councilor Ribiak, second by Councilor King, that the agenda for the August 4th, 2015 regular meeting of council be adopted. Are there any additions or changes to the agenda? There being none, I call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? That motion is carried. The next item is disclosure of pecuniary interest and the general nature thereof. That is any conflicts of interest that members may have and have to disclose. Do any members have any conflicts that they need to disclose at this time? None. There are no conflicts. Can that be noted in the minutes, please, Seven. Madam Clerk? Seven. Thank you. Now we'll move to presentations and delegations. We have a, a presentation this evening from Robin Garrett, Friends of the Greenbelt Foundation. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Good to see you back. I'm back, yes. And uh, you may recall back in May, I was here telling you about an idea we had working with um, the town to paint an intersection at uh, uh, Canborough and Effingham in Ward 2. And I'm here to say that uh, I'm, I'm very sorry for um, what has ended up happening. We did paint, and as you may know, uh, the rain, much to our dismay, uh, washed away uh, the painting. And so I'm here to apologize for that and to let you know that um, we have been testing this to find out uh, what is needed to make sure that it, it will adhere. And uh, we do know that it needs at least two days of, of dry time. And as you may know, that rain came upon us overnight and it really did uh, wash away what was there. So I do apologize to town, but particularly to the four businesses that were in that intersection. I know that they um, for went to some business that uh, the day that we were there and um, 
I have spoken to each and every one of them individually, and I have apologized to them as well. Um, so I, we want to make sure that uh, any future efforts that we make in this way um, are going to be uh, going to stick. <laughs> and we actually have a number of other communities that have come to us and asked for an intersection. So you were the first. Unfortunately, um, we learned a lot from it. Um, and it, and I want to let you know that we are prepared to come back again if you are. Uh, when we've tested it, and we're sure it will work, um, particularly wanting to uh, make sure that there are no, there's no rain in the forecast for two days. Okay, so thank, thank you very much or? for your presentation. I wonder if, uh, well, certainly we appreciate uh, you coming this evening. I did bring a report to council last meeting about it, um, and uh, I do appreciate all of your efforts and the Greenbelt's efforts, uh, Greenbelt Foundation efforts, in order to do this. It was a great, great event, and so many enjoyed it. And uh, I talked to some of the parents, for example. Of, some of the children that, that just love doing it and unfortunately the weather didn't cooperate. I wonder if members of council have any questions or uh, additional comments for Ms. Garrett at this time? No? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Ribiak. I, I do, Mr. Mayor, and thank you very much. And, and I don't know whether the question is properly directed to uh, our speaker or perhaps to, uh, to the Director of Recreation, but do we have plans to do this again? And if so, do we have plans to do it in the same intersection or a different one? Ms. Van Ravensway, can you answer? At this point, we do not have plans to um, to do it again. Uh, as uh, Ms. Garrett said, that they are testing, and perhaps they would do it in another municipality prior to. And I'm sure that she would be back to um, ask again if if that were um, the choice. Thank you. <coughs> thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Councillor. I actually spoke with the chair of the farmer's market mm -hmm. uh, in, in Pelham, who is also a business owner in that area, in the Ridgeville area. And he was uh, upset as well that it, uh, it rained and, and ran away, but he was anxious and suggested perhaps a lower uh, traffic area, but a higher profile area in a, in a certain degree. So maybe at the market here uh, at the parking lot might be a good area. So that can be blocked off easily not interrupting too many people as that very busy intersection uh, did and uh, so that might be a, the next test case. That, that's one idea. So that's something that we'll have to evaluate uh, coming forward and we look forward to perhaps you coming forward with other recommendations that Council can consider in the future. Councilor Durley. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just uh, I received many calls about the traffic disruption for a full day as well because that is uh, a major one and in order to get to from point A to point B, you had to go to almost a point Z in order to come around. So, so people were, uh, you know, the people that were using these roads were, were there. And as a matter of fact, I had a couple of people say, see, I told you, as after it all had gone away. So uh, we should give it some real sober thought before, uh, before doing that again. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Councilor Durley. And we'll look forward to uh, some recommendations coming forward that Council then can consider at that time. Thanks again for your presentation and all your work on this. I do have a resolution. It's been moved by Councillor King, seconded by Councillor Durley. Be it resolved that the information presented by Robin Garrett on behalf of the Friends of the Green Belt, offering an apology for the street mural at Camborough Road and Effingham Street washing away, and for any inconvenience offered to the businesses in the area, be received and accepted. I'm going to call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? That motion is carried. Thanks again for your presentation. We look forward to working with you on this. Thank you. Bye now. We now move to uh, a delegation, and this is a proclamation request by Reese Evans and Paul O'Hara regarding Lyme D Disease Awareness Month. Thank you for joining us, gentlemen. Thank you, guys. Thank you, very, thank you very much. Good evening, members of council and Mr. Mayor. My friend Paul and I are here, here tonight to discuss a very important topic that, are, that is very close to our hearts, and it is chronic Lyme disease. Um, Paul, Paul and I understand. Paul and I understand that it is a vital piece of our success to have council involved in in this. Um, we would like to ask council that we one they they dedicate a month towards chronic Lyme disease, and they put they publish an article in. The, the monthly newsletter. Okay. Talking about 
about um, some kind of contribution towards Can Lime. Can Lime is one of the central hubs where people can get research and donate in Canada. I'll explain in a second why that's so very important. Um, essentially, I promise not to get into too much scientific jargon, it'll be at a very high level, but Lyme disease is an inflammatory infection spread through tick bites. We mostly do know that. Um, what's not known is it's actually broken into three different stages. Early infection, infection spreads, chronic Lyme. Chronic Lyme can completely debilitate people. I will get into the severity um, in a little bit of depth. But most importantly, the latter of the two is that it, it becomes more difficult to treat as you go through the three stages of, of Lyme disease itself. Uh, Lyme infection broke out in 1982. There were two schools of thought at that time, and it actually has not been revisited in Canada since. So over 30 years, there's been no progress there. So we will talk about, again, like the severity itself, but there's a general notion, and it's a bit misconceived, that Lyme disease is a tame or mild illness. It has taken lives. We have some stats that do support that, and it will continue to, especially as it goes undiagnosed for some time, which it is right now. So predominantly, we're here for one reason. We're asking for support from the council um, to help spread basic awareness in our local community. We have people that have been suffering from <coughs> Lyme in our local community, someone close to my heart, of course, and Reese's. Um, getting back to the school of thought, would be as if there were only one flu vaccine since 1982. It is an infectious illness Lyme disease, and every year there's a new strand, new strain for the flu virus, and that's why they basically change the testing when we go for the flu shot every single year. Um, worse, the ELISA test, it's called, is the only test we have to date uh, for Lyme itself, and it's scientifically proven now to yield false negatives, even in most positive cases. So those who want to be treated have to go to the states. They bear the costs. But worse, they go through many doctors before they get a positive diagnosis itself. And that, again, furthers them down the ladder of the three stages of Lyme, and the symptoms worsen, and they're exposed to that. Um, worst thing about Lyme disease itself is that Lyme disease is known as the great imitator, meaning it has symptoms that are shared with some major common illnesses. Two notable are MS and dementia. Uh, my sister is someone who has chronic Lyme disease, and the doctors thought in the first 18 months that maybe she did have MS, and that's why she was digressing so quickly. Um, so we definitely want to talk about that a little bit. Uh, our inspiration for this, for this awareness. Adeline O'Hara went through 18 months and 18 different doctors. Physical digression before going through to the States to get properly diagnosed. As a result, um, she and many others now have chronic Lyme disease, which is the latter of the, or the, the last of the three stages. And um, on a daily basis, uh, she's lucky to speak a couple sentences to a human being. Um, it's impaired her cognitive processes. Lyme attacks basically like the receptors that it hits. So it can be cognitive, it can be respiratory. A lot of people have trouble breathing. Uh, doctors will have them on the, uh, basically like sit back on something on an angle so that they can breathe better. Um, but it, it attacks where it's at. So for some people it's muscular, but the cognitive is essentially what will like, debilitate you because your brain motors can't function at all. And many people in the chronic stages of Lyme do have this. It's very difficult to treat, and it's very expensive as well. Um, the ride for Lyme, the shirts that we were wearing, all the donations go to Can Lyme. Uh, two people that we knew basically biked 150 kilometers per day, coast to coast, to try <coughs> to raise awareness. And Reese will talk about this more. Um, but each day they basically uh, said, this day is for this person. So they came across someone that had Lyme disease. And not in a single case was someone able to receive treatment in Canada. In no way is this to pick on our medical system. It's just because the school of thought has not been, again, like addressed. But just to note that people do have this, and it can be very serious. A scare that I had that was very real is two years ago, a girl I went to school with and grew up with um, was talking to me just about how she can't focus. She sleeps eight or nine or ten hours, and she's physically weak. She was a great athlete, and she has no strength. Um, and doctors said, well, you have chronic fatigue. And that's a bit of a scapegoat that we often go to when it's up to diagnose something. And 
my sister had been sick with chronic Lyme for two years at this point. And not trying to scare her, I said, have you considered getting tested for Lyme disease? She didn't know too much on like the, the actual aspects of that itself. Went to get tested and uh, she's been in, in a wheelchair since for the last two months, but she is positive for chronic Lyme. So that's not gonna happen every time where you run into someone that has a similar experience. So we feel it's important just so people can have resources to go to and understand where they have to go to be tested itself. Again, in terms of like the severity, it has taken lives. We have one quick slide that I won't get into too much about the figures itself, but Lyme disease is, is very serious. And um, the only way typically that people are treating is through logs, like they would somewhere else. You're keeping a log of, of habits. Um, there's no particular treatment itself in Canada. In the States, there's a very popular doctor. Some of you may have heard of him in Florida, but he's still typically dealing with the first six months of contraction. After that six months, it becomes chronic Lyme. It's very difficult to treat at that stage. Go ahead, Dan. Daniel Cookson and Daniel Daniel Cook Corso and Tanner Cookson embarked on a 57-day nationwide ride for Lyme. Every day that they went on this ride for Lyme, they ran into somebody who suffers from the disease. And everyone that they ran into had a different story about how, how, how they couldn't receive treatment and had to go to the States or ha had difficulty receiving treatment. So we would like to attest to the fact that this region has always uh, looked after some of the more caring cases. Um, during the ride, and uh, I know Mayor Dave does know about this, uh, the Mayor of Victoria actually dedicated the month of May to Lyme disease. That was why sort of our ask was just to have a month. Um, maybe in the future it could be May. They're looking to make May the month for Lyme, just like a different month is for cancer or something of that like. So other councils have followed. If we look at the council's strategic plan, advocacy for Lyme is certainly consistent with uh, this, this council's goal to provide equity for its people and the mission to enhance the, the quality of life which has been tarnished for some people, especially as, as it prolongs as they can't receive treatment. These are a couple figures. Um, don't have too much to talk about this. So the only figures we can get, and it is important to note, are US based. So I lads, feel free to look at the site. So doctors do put up stats on this site every single year. Um, <laughs> Lyme disease is actually more prevalent proportionally in Canada. So typically it's about a tenth or more of that that people that suffer with this in Canada. So 300,000 people in the States, about 30,000 in Canada. It's about one one thousandth of people that have Lyme disease in some fashion. It doesn't necessarily mean that they have chronic Lyme to the point that they can't work or even can't live. But half the ticks in an area where Lyme is popular will carry the infection. And again, why it's so important that we have a test that does work is there's not necessarily a physical rash or something that you can note. And the stat is that half of the people have no idea that they were bitten by a tick. There's no physical illness itself. It could be mental or like respiratory or something like that. It, it, in, in Canada, um, Canada right now puts up a barrier to those that have chronic Lyme disease because they have to go through the states to receive treatment and put go through the cost. So it is my mission and Paul's mission to eliminate this barrier and with your help we can hopefully minimize these barriers and, and possibly defeat them down the road. Thank you very much for your present for, for your time tonight on a very important subject to us and we look forward to working with you in the future. We're happy to open the floor and have a question. Do want to note that this is Reese that came forward. Um, he's had my sister and a couple friends that um, he's he's seen have gone downhill because because of Lyme disease itself. I'm here for questions and to help to help him with the presentation. But certainly, if there are any questions about the illness itself, 
the Ride for Lyme, the shirts that we're wearing. We'd love to spend a minute or two if you guys have time to answer those. Thank you very much, Mr. Nohara and Mr. Evans. For your presentation, I wonder if members of council have any questions for our presenters. Councilor Pop. So through you, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Uh, very impressed, very impressed. Um, as you know, those of us who are pet owners are always constantly reminded about ticks and more we take our animals through different parts of our community. But I'm just curious to, so in fact, there is no health data in Canada that tracks the incidence of Lyme Absolutely disease. Absolutely none, sir. None. Is there any reason for that? Is there yeah, any? so when we go back to 1982, that's when Lyme itself broke out. It's right. existed for over a century, right. but the two schools of thought were it could be treated through some basic flu shots like that, and it was done in a couple of weeks. And the other school of thought was it was an infectious illness itself, so not a virus. It was, and if it went untreated, um, they had to revisit that and basically find some treatment. There, there, there is no actual treatment for it itself. Animals typically won't express the same symptoms no, they because don't. their systems are a lot stronger. That's right. They have they antibodies are. and basically like their their actual like immune systems can handle it. Mm -hmm. uh, my dog personally has Lyme disease, but he doesn't live as if he does. Um, we have very weakened like immune systems to that. And it is new, so our bodies haven't built up basically um, any kind of system to fight that off at this stage. Thank you. Counselor? Anyone else? Anything further, Counselor? Sure. Um, I'm as the mayor has just suggested, I think that you need to take this presentation to the region and present it to the Public Health and Social Services Committee as a matter of information and also for their reference as part of a possibly even researching the... Um, we, have, we have many contacts within the medical field and I think that awareness has to be heightened. So this is something that I would highly suggest to you if you're amenable to that and I think we can help you uh, mm -hmm. And I threw the mayor and uh, Councillor Beatty is the. Absolutely. So you, sh you need to uh, bring this forward, and I think you'll get, I think, a very, very worthy response and at least heighten awareness across the municipality, particularly with the region uh, on this particular. Uh, because uh, I'm aware of your sister, I'm aware of someone else that I know who has Lyme's disease. At this stage, they're not. They're not digressing, but they're, they're, they're doing the same route. They've gone to the U.S. and are <coughs> seeking treatment in multiple areas. It's only to their credit that they have the financial resources to do this, sure. because if they don't, they would never be able to do right. the, to handle that. So that's my suggestion, and many thanks for the uh, very, very informative and <laughs> provocative presentation. Thank, thank you. very important to us. Thank you. Very, thank you. Thank you. I just like to say thank you very much for uh, having us again, and thank you very much for t taking us seriously because we want to work with people, and we value we value the town's opinion, and we value the town's collaboration on this on this topic. Thank you very much. There may be other questions. Do other councilors have questions? For the two presenters, Councillor Durling. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, not really a question, but I think the uh, an important thing to do would be to get the name of the website that that the people can make donations and get information from. www.rideforline.ca is what you noted in your presentation. And so yeah. if we make that public and perhaps our uh, on our website as well, that would be uh, a, a link to that perhaps would be something that's good because it certainly is a, a, a very important cause. I know some folks that have had uh, that are in the chronic Lyme stage, and it's not very not very nice to oh, see, and nice. and it, it's very devastating. So uh, thank you for bringing this forward, and uh, again donations and trying to get something going in Canada would be certainly a benefit to all of us. Thank you thank very you. much, Councillor Durley. Any other questions? I, I just have a quick question, and it's we have discussed it a little bit at the region, um, and and they do have a kit to remove ticks, and and in fact, I was driving by the Humane Society, our Humane Society, the other day, and they said bring your animal in and check for ticks and sure. those kind of things, and, and it appears that th there are, they say there are two types of of ticks: one that um, is a dog tick, and then the other that isn't a dog tick that that has that in um, a, a deer tick or whatever, but it allows Lyme to to proceed. There is a type of tick that won't carry the basically mm -hmm. like um, Lyme itself. Okay, so that there is. is. Correct. Um, typically, those aren't the ones that we as humans will encounter. Though. 
Um, you'll have to be going in in taller grasses. Um, those ticks are predominantly where short grass meets tall grass. That's actually the easiest way to say that. And a lot of us will live on, you know, the country properties. Yeah, especially in, in Fond Hill yeah. and Fenwick. It's, uh, it's an issue where I think more, probably we've, we know people more than the average town, but maybe that's why we can make a bit of a mm -hmm. difference. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, definitely, if you have a tick, put it in a jar and take it. I don't want to say your doctor, the family, and I don't, this is not a slash at like the medical, you know, community, but somewhere like a humane society or someone who deals with animals even okay. a vet might be a better go there and they do have tests that can say if the tick has anything or not don't necessarily have a test that will taste positive for Lyme itself because that's on the person but a test that can say yes this tick does in fact carry some kind of infection mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. um, thank you one more Reese, go one, ahead. More, one more piece of information sir so you sir you you made reference to the the www.rightforlime.ca. Yes, Councilor. Another Bailey, another um, website that you can go to is Can Lime, and the the ride money was actually going directly to that website. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and that's www.canlime.ca. Can <coughs> well, the proceeds from the ride for Lime are going to Can Lime for research and things like that. But um, the two young boys, our age, who went on the journey. Um, they, ha they had some followers. At times, people were behind. And it's possible that this could become a yearly thing mm. if if it can make money. So they were a little overambitious, and their goal was 100000 And they're sitting just over twenty right now. Um, so they have a long way to go. So it's our hope that, Mr. Durley, basically what you said was pretty much what, what we came here for, um, just so that people could know that there is a site that you can donate to, and there's a way that you can get some basic info online itself. Good. Even just the symptoms, because some people will be experiencing the symptoms but have no idea, you know, like what they have. So, thank you very much for your presentation and for answering our questions. I, if you hold on for a second here, I do have a resolution. It's been moved by Councillor Durley, seconded by Councillor King. Be it resolved that the information submitted by Reese Evans and Paul Nohara outlining Lyme Disease Awareness Month proposal and highlighted for the Ride for Lyme initiative be received, and that Council declare August as Lyme Disease Awareness Awareness Month in the town of Pelham. Any comments or questions to that? I'm going to call the question. All those in favor, any opposed, that motion is carried unanimously. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to sign this proclamation and then I'm going to ask Councillor Durley to join me with our two presenters that we can present this uh, to them. Okay. So I'm signing this on behalf of Council. And I would ask Councillor Durley if you join me. Councillor Durley is the Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Durley. Thank you, Councillor Council Durley. Thank you. So this is on behalf of all our Council coll colleagues. This is a proclamation. August is Lyme Disease Awareness Month. Whereas in the town of Helm and across Canada, thousands of Canadians are suffering from chronic Lyme disease. And whereas the Adlen Project was established to honour a Pelham resident to raise awareness of the disease and to raise funds toward enabling treatment in Canada. And whereas the Council of the town of Pelham supports all measures designed to advance and protect the health of its citizens and of all Canadians, and whereas to increase awareness of Lyme disease in our community, while it is recognized that May is the Canadian Lyme Disease Awareness Month, the importance of this issue is ongoing. Therefore, be it resolved that the Corporation of the Town of Pelham does hereby proclaim August as Lyme Disease Awareness Month in Pelham, dated the Town of Pelham on this fourth day of August, 2008. Thank you very much. No Thanks for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. This is for you. Thank you. Thank you. And please pass along our uh, of course. best wishes to Adeline. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Take care. Thank you again to our presenters for their presentation and for their care and concern. Now we'll move to a report from our regional councillor, Councillor Beatty. Thank you for joining us this evening, Councillor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for the comments. Just to follow through 
a very uh, powerful presentation. Um, this summer alone, I've been bitten by 10 ticks, and I'm taking three to five a day off our dogs. It's a case where it's really phenomenal. Mm -hmm. uh, and we live in that area where the back field of 50, 13 acres of Oak Haven estates is long grass, mm -hmm. meeting up with short grass and so on. Um, and just to clarify, the, the, the one that's the line carrier is the black-legged. Um, you can take the tick in a container to public health right. at the region headquarters, right. and they, they can do a right. diagnosis for you as to whether or not uh, it's the black-legged type or whether it's the, the, the regular dog tick. Okay. Thank you very much, Councillor. And, and perhaps uh, staff can um, get some of those um, the, the kits and information from mm -hmm. public health and the tick removal. They have a tick removal tool. That yeah. perhaps we can make available, especially like a little during excavator. this month of August. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, Councillor. Hey, you have before you a written report for the uh, the four uh, committees for this uh, term, and the council meeting. I'm going to only mention three items here, uh, and then we'll talk first on another issue. Uh, Project Lifesaver is something that is known to the town of Felton in terms of involvement in the past. Uh, the report first came from public health, basically saying that they were not interested in proceeding. It was sent back to public health staff. Public health staff then brought back a report indicating they wanted to add FTEs to be able to coordinate the program, etc. The general response was, no, we don't want FTEs, we don't want to add staffing to this, we want to see what we'll do to build with the volunteer base, etc. So it's been referred back for a second time uh, to staff. Um, the Ministry of Transportation concerns, obviously, the City of Thorough has a resolution concerning Highway 406 and St. David's Road, both for both bike and pedestrian facilities. With the large number of students traversing that area uh, from the, the, the housing in Thorold and uh, North St. Catharines, Merritt, et cetera, uh, really a, a major safety concern. It's been ongoing for as long as I've been involved as a regional councillor trying to get the, the Ministry of Transportation to look at alternatives. And it's a complicated process because the number of access ways and exits, et cetera, along that stretch. And the last one I want to mention is the move to support the City of St. Catharines' request for double duty councillors. I was one of four councillors who didn't vote for that. I think it will lead to more partisan politics because they're basing it on a ward system. The person will be the representative councillor for the, one of the wards in St. Catharines but also be a regional councillor. And the other pressure that I'm really concerned about is when they look at the models where there are double duty councillors, the compensation level is far in excess of what we're talking about here. I was just looking at the current city council rate in, in St. Catharines. And the, the main concern I have is I do not see in any way this being trans, uh, transmitted over to smaller communities. Um, but would you mean a change somehow to our award system in this town? I would not see that that would be favorable. I think, and I, I applaud you as a council for receiving me on at your regular meetings to give me a report. I think the, the, the communication that happens between, between the mayor and myself to you here is the issue that they're trying to solve, okay? And it can be solved in a far more, I think, effective way uh, than going through the double duty. However, the, the question is going to be, when it goes to the province, whether the province will allow only one municipality to do it, whether they'll want to do a broadcast uh, across all uh, 12 communities, et cetera. But it's something that just, you know, I, I did not personally support it, mainly because of the two reasons, that being the word versus the whole, whole city of St. Catharines, and secondly, the, the obvious cost, the pressure cost. We're looking at $90,000 plus for council to do this in Burlington. And it's a case where I believe, I can't say for Burlington, but most of, most of the people of double duty have offices, uh, clerical staff, et cetera. And it's quite an expensive proposition. It does reduce physically the number of counselors, but at cost, mm -hmm. significant cost, potential. So those are three. Uh, I guess the one I should mention, because I've got so much time for council and it's been so much in the press, is the presentation by Ted Meridian. Um, response to comments been, being made uh, by one of our regional counselors, and it's received more than its fair share of notoriety and news, et cetera. It's been unfortunate. It took about two and a half hours for a council meeting just dealing with that, that one issue. And as a result, all the other business that you see here was conducted within a matter of sort of a block motion to put it, to put it through. Mind you, it does have good audience at the standing committee, but sure didn't at the council meeting right. because we went 30 minutes past curfew and had to really push everything through uh, to get out by uh, the final curfew of 11 o'clock. Thank you very much, Councillor Beatty. And uh, there I see one councillor signaling, so there might be questions or comments. Uh, councillor Rubiak. I, I have questions, but I, I wonder whether Councillor Beatty could just repeat the topic of, the, of his last comment because I, I missed it. I'm sorry. Councillor? The last one? Well, yes. Basically, it's Councillor Petrowski. Councillor Petrowski has made some uh, very strong statements with regard to gay marriage, et cetera, and it's right. all the. Oh ongoing amount of media that's happened around that and continues to, to happen. So we had a presentation, it's the 
second bullet at the very end of Councillor Beatty's uh, uh, document here by Ted Meridian in response to the comments in respect to uh, issuance of a public statement. Th thank you. I'm sure it was my hearing. I just, I just missed, okay. missed thank it. You. And, I, and I appreciate the, the comment. Um, I have a question, if I, if I may, Mr. Mayor. And it's with regard to um, the motion that was passed in Regional Council with regard to support to uh, the two uh, requests by regarding the airports. I wonder whether you can just talk to that for a moment and maybe explain um, what council expects, uh, regional council expects uh, to happen in the months going forward. I can pass that on to the mayor. But basically, it's a matter of receiving it, but looking for more, more information and clarity. Thank you very much, Councillor, um, and Councillor Ribiak. So, um, Mayor Senzik from the City of St. Catharines put forward the resolution from the city regarding the Niagara District Airport. Um, and uh, we had received correspondence from a number of those uh, contributing communities, Niagara and the Lake and, and Niagara Falls. But Council also uh, received information from the Town of Pelham, the City of Port Colborne, um, the Township of Waynefleet, and the City of Welland regarding the Niagara District Airports. This is on our agenda. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. Uh, so I made an amendment which was actually supported by Mayor Senzik as a seconder to essentially do the same thing for the district or for the central airport that we're doing for the district airport and that is um, have preliminary discussions with the airport commissions and the participating municipalities and uh, regarding the transfer of operations of the airport to the regional municipality of Niagara. I think many councillors were compelled by the fact that it will require a triple majority in order to I'll say upload that line of business uh, to the region and uh, recognition as well as the um, Niagara District, sorry, the Niagara Central um, correspondence and correspondence from the area municipalities uh, stated that the two airports do work in, in tandem. So I think that's why council supported it um, and it is leading to discussion. Um, the mayor did, Mayor Senzik did suggest that there might be two reports coming forward so we'll see how this uh, how, how this uh, comes forward in the future, but currently now they are both being investigated. And then they will also be going to the um, Transpor Transportation Strategy Steering Committee of which Councillor Papp uh, sits, and that's sl uh, slotted for the first quarter of 2016. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and, and, and Councillor Beatty. Um, so your expectation over the next six months basically is, is what? That staff will be in, in touch with uh, uh, with the commissions, or will there be will, will there be a, a consultant hired to put together a report? I, what, what what can we anticipate uh, that, yeah. that that we know of? Or my my understanding is that it would be, or maybe Councilor Beatty, you can assist on this. But I it, it wasn't to hire a consultant; it was to, for staff to work on it, and that it was a resolution of council, and it's what council wants. So that staff uh, contact the area, the municipalities are involved, and also the commissions, and work together with them with the idea of of uh, possibly uploading these services. Okay. So yeah. we'll, we'll continue to, to, to work on it. I know Councillor Beatty uh, and I are both supportive of, and many were supportive of the move to, to, to include both airports. Councillor? Okay, with staff basically bringing forward a report and using the Transportation Steering Committee as the, the major vessel to bring it forward. And I think the only commentary that I heard is that whether it would be an automatic one-time upload or whether it would be a phasing in process of municipalities phasing out and the region taking over, that that would come through the exploratory process, seeing what, what a business case could be put forward in the okay. time sequence. Thank you. Councillor? Thank you. And of course, speaking as, as uh, chair of the uh, Niagara Central Dorothy Rungling Airport Commission, we're happy that that, mm -hmm. that the motion was passed, of course, and we're anxious to participate any way we can in, in, in making that, that happen. Um, just that there is a, shall we call it, a paucity of information about where this is going and how it's going to get there. Right. And uh, we'd like to find out more. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, Councillor Beatty and I will work on that over the coming weeks uh, to, to hopefully provide some clarity. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you.
Another item, Mr. Murray, that you and I talked about before the meeting, and I did mention from this report, uh, I was absent for the planning meeting because there was a two-day meeting of the Escarpment Commission. Uh, the one day was a policy day. But I was quite concerned when I saw the report and the mapping that had been proposed and found out that there had been no dialogue between senior planners at the region of Niagara and anyone at the NEP, or NEC rather. Um, I got a list of the major points of, of concern uh, that were in error or actually incorrect. Uh, pass that on to the commissioner. As I say, there was no time because of the shortness of time for the meeting, no time to have discussion about that uh, at the meeting, but it's a case where the commissioner of planning has now been in touch with the manager at the NEC to try and straighten that out. I want to point out one thing, because the, the regional staff took it that the, the, the Scarborough Commission has decided on a new mapping process, and the, the fact is we haven't. We have been over the last few years seeing section by section with possibilities. The original mapping is 1985. The state of technology and modeling and so on has changed significantly. Uh, there are basically, there's more than four, four essential areas for the escarpment. Uh, the natural area, the protected area, agriculture rural, and recreational. And it's a case where um, it's a question of whether or not we include outliers that aren't in the escarpment but are created, they, they exist, but they're outside the escarpment per se. Uh, concern for significant woodlands and their impact in terms of the boundary of the escarpment. And at our August meeting, we'll be hearing about the last section and so on. And so we'll basically have four proposals of mapping put forward. And we, we can't decide which mapping will prevail. We can recommend as a group, as, as a group. And I'm not absolutely certain who would be the final decision maker, whether it would be cabinet, whether it be the Minister of Natural Resources, but there'd be some process. My intention is that when that final mapping is done is to have both through the media and through a uh, public consultation, uh, a presentation showing people what the mapping is. Because it's, it's not like the green belt where there's a linear line. You're, you're in the green belt and you're out of it. Uh, the mapping is very irregular. I personally was surprised to hear that Marlin Street, Street, Street Park was not entirely in it. Uh, the northern section is, the wooded section. Um, but there's been some discussion in particular about the Fond Hill game. Yes. And I was hoping that they would say, let's take Dr. Menzies, Menzies basically definition in terms of treating it as the totality. They haven't done that yet, uh, but it's a case to put forward are some very, very clear and very strict uh, considerations for it to be counted in the escarpment in any one of the protected areas. And the Fondo Cayman's totality doesn't totally meet that, but it's a case where they've, they've left in the communication that I got regarding this matter with the region that they would be open to it if there would be aboriginal or community or regional concerns expressing a desire to have full protection of Fondo Cayman. So it's a matter for discussion. Right now, the answer is it's not on the, the, the mapping process, but the fact is it could be. Uh, and the one thing I want to clarify, because I had discussion with the mayor before that meeting, is that the developable section of Marley Street, Street Park is not being recommended for inclusion. It's only the wooded section to the north abutting the later property and so on. So that, that will evolve in the month of August, and as I say, both through media and I'm, I'm considering a, a public forum to have people provide the maps to show what, the, what, the, mm -hmm. what it was before, what mm -hmm. it is now. The, the advantage to going to more protected area or natural area is that there is a tax, a tax advantage to the property owner. It's not like wetlands where you're all of a sudden burdened by having right. this, this provincially significant thing. There is a tax <coughs> advantage. And by and large, the, the movement is with the mapping, the proposed mapping, depending on how far they go in terms of the de definition, is it's going to be towards more natural, more protected, and it's a case where there's some more flexibility in the agriculture area for um, the idea of making agriculture more sustainable, financially sustainable and viable. Thank you very much for that uh, update and that information. We do have an item of correspondence, as I pointed out to you, uh, regarding the, uh, from the NEC. Um, right. So thank you very much for that. And you indicated that, that letter, uh, there was a letter from the NEC regarding the, the cane. Perhaps you can share that with uh, myself and all of Council. I will do that. Um, the letter was in two parts, and I'll just have to see uh, the manager. The first part I was to share publicly that we had a discussion with council. The second part were more delicate terms that basically would be, be better dealt with on a one-to-one -one dis okay. discussion. So Whatever, I whatever is available publicly, I, I would ask that you share with council. Okay. I'll Thank for, forward the email to you. Thank you very much. Any other questions for Councillor Beatty? Councillor Pat. Very quickly through you, Mr. Mayor. Just a quick question. Uh, the Commissioner presented a report on the Standards and Poor's downgrading of Ontario credit rating. Did that no effect on the region? Um, our state remains the same. Still the as same. It has been, but it's a case where it was just, just an information report in terms of that it had happened and, and what the change was. I think it's down to A minus, is it? I believe. The, 
Thank you. I, I spoke to the commissioner about that, um, and the only impact that the commissioner said, or the central <coughs> report says it doesn't affect the region, but I said, what about if there's lending from or borrowing from Infrastructure Ontario? And so those rates could increase. So there are some communities uh, that are using funding from Infrastructure Ontario most recently, and it could mean that that, that number would go up a little bit. The second, Go second question, very quickly. Um, um, with the double duty, so what are the next steps? Because what I'd like to suggest that while this dialogue continues with the region, that it also should be something that we discuss at our own council level as to whether we support, don't support. So I don't, what, what are the next steps in this whole? I think the next step is to find out from the, the government department in terms of, of whether or not it is possible to do it. Right. And how to proceed the ministry um, itself because it's we're not the proposal is not for the entire region right so we're not in, into you know purple majority kind of material and it's a it, the question mark is will the province allow one community correct to represent the, the, the population differently than the other 11. so so just to provide additional information last term of council we dealt with this issue or two terms ago we dealt with this issue and i spoke about this at regional council uh, because the city of Thorold had requested that uh, they wanted to move to this model of the dual councillor. At that point, the information we received from regional staff was that if one does it, all have to do it. And so everybody said, well, forget it. We don't want to necessarily change uh, what's working here, et cetera. Um, in this case, regional council was compelled, including myself, was compelled by additional information saying, no, no, it, it is allowable. Our, we re, uh, received actually legal advice suggesting that a municipality could do it if it wanted to, uh, i.e. if the minister says yes, it goes through, I think it may still have to go through triple majority, then a municipality could do it. The, the regulation is essentially the minister has to say, yeah, go ahead, look at it. Then it has to go to a public meeting at the region. It has to be approved at the region with a majority, then it has to go to the municipalities and get the majority of municipal councils representing a majority of the population for that community to enact this change. Um, you're right, Council, we haven't had a formal discussion about it around this council table. Uh, we did briefly last term, you'll recall, and I think you were there, uh, it was more informal yeah, and it was in this room, and um, it was sort of something that we at least I thought about as we redid our ward boundaries um, last term. So it would require us changing the ward boundary structure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I look forward to watching this unfold and uh, hopefully we'll have some. There's a third item and I don't know whether you did deal with I heard through another level there was a discussion or was there a discussion about electing the regional chair at large? Yes, Hi, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. What that was the... that was also uh, on the agenda, but it was deferred. Okay. Until Thank September. you. That's so. All. Actually, I do want to talk to the chambers of commerce that were quite Good. involved in that, and want to talk to uh, Ms. Fabiano. Okay. Instance. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Any others? Thank you very much, Councillor Beatty, for your report. And. Um, it has been moved by Councillor Papp, seconded by Councillor Rubiak, be it resolved that the August 4th, 2015 report of Regional Councillor Brian Beatty be received for information. All those in favour? Any opposed? That motion is carried. Thanks again for your comprehensive report and enjoy a and little bit of a reprieve from Regional Council. I was going to say, and note that the next time will not be until the month of September, so we'll see, see you in the fall. All right. Thank you very much, Councillor. Take care. Now we move to minutes for adoption. It's been moved by Councillor... Pap, second by Councillor Kersey, be it resolved the following minutes be adopted as printed, circulated and read. Minutes of our regular council meeting of July 20th and of our special council meeting of July 22nd. Are there any errors or omissions in those minutes? There being none, I call the question. All those in favour? Any opposed? That motion is carried. Now we move to consent. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, we do. We move to consent agenda items for uh, separate or for consideration, are there any items that council would like lifted for separate consideration? There being none, it's been moved by Council Riviak, second by Council King. Be it resolved the following consent agenda items be received and the recommendations contained therein be approved as applicable. One, recommendations of the regular committee, committee 
meeting of the whole of July 6th, 2015. And the rec recommendation is to be resolved that the recommendations arising be received and approved. And also the minutes of that priorities and policy committee meeting of July 20th. Staff reports of routine nature for information or action, an, an updated temporary works policy, and the recommendation is be it resolved the council receive the issue summary report temporary works policy and that committee recommend to council that the policy be approved and that policy works 08 road occupant permit control be repealed and replaced by this temporary works policy. The second item is the Maple Acre Terms of Reference. Be it resolved that the report outlining the Maple Acre Terms of Reference be received and that the Maple Acre Advisory Committee Terms of Reference be and are hereby approved. We have two items of information correspondence. One is from the Niagara Scar Commission. I'll try that. Niagara Escarpment Commission. Advice on potential addition of lands to the uh, Niagara escarpment plan area and Councilor Beatty spoke about this and also a resolution for fairness in provincial infrastructure funds. We have <coughs> one uh, piece of information from the Regional Municipality of Niagara that we spoke about already. It's regarding the Dorothy, uh, the Niagara Central Dorothy Runjing Airport. Be it resolved that the correspondence C8312 Niagara District Airport from the Region of Niagara be received for information. And then also we have committee minutes for information and that's from the Architectural Design Advisory Committee meeting of June 18th. Any items the council would like to discuss? Councillor Kersey. I have uh, two minor issues, uh, Mr. Mayor. With respect to the temporary works policy uh, under conditions, Item number four, the applicant agrees and accepts that a security deposit in an, amo in an amount is stated. I, I, and yet we refer to the fact that there's a minimum of $2,000 earlier in the policy. So I don't know whether that's just a typo and... Thank you. Just like some clarity on that. Madam Director, <clears throat> what should it read if it's a typo? Uh, I took out the amount of the conditions just in case we wanted that to float on the form and leave the conditions the same. So I think it probably should just read a, that a security deposit will be required okay. and it's assumed that you can look on the form for that yeah. amount. Okay. Okay, thank you. Can you make that uh, change? Thank you. The clerk has said that she can make that change and will do so. Thank you for your eagle eyes. And your second item, Councillor? Second, uh, it's a different item. In okay, let's see if, if Councillors have any other items regarding the temporary works policy. Mm -hmm. I do want to say thank you very much to staff for revising the policy <coughs> based on Council's discussion at our committee meeting. So thank you very much. You seem to have addressed all of the areas of concern from Council. So thank you. Councillor, now to your next item. Uh, with reference to the terms of reference for the Maple Lake or Advisory Committee, I note that it is specifically limited to the design phase and I wondered whether they would also have a role during the construction phase as um, a group that would be available to work with the contractor or the consultant, whoever's our agent there, uh, should a need, the need arise or a question arise with respect to form and function during construction, which often happens. Thank you. Let's get a response from the CAO, Mr. CAO. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, when we put the terms of reference together, it was um, uh, it was thought that the uh, formal role of the advisory committee would be through the design phase. Uh, when it went transitioned into the construction phase, that uh, construction management would be handled by the town. Um, but that's not to say that if there was input required from either the library or from the community at large that wouldn't be sought out just not on a formal basis. So in essence, we wanted to put an expiry date on the uh, on the advisory committee. Thank you. Councillor? And just as a follow-up, um, I'm kind of curious that construction management will be, be, be handled by the town. Do we have our staff have the time and take this with a grain of salt, the expertise to be able to do on-site management uh, or would we be better <coughs> if we're going to design build not to have a, a, a consultant working on our behalf? Uh, Thanks for the question. I think we've, this is similar to other recent projects. Mm -hmm. 
um, where staff have had that input, Mr. CEO? I think you Mr. Mayor. To answer the council's question, yeah, we yes, we do have the uh, the expertise on on, on staff, um, and it is a very similar scope to Fire Station Three, uh, which was a design build, uh, same type of situation where the advisory committee was the firefighters, if you will, but the project management was handled by the town. Uh, it was a very successful project that came uh, came in on time and on budget, and we would anticipate the same for this scale of project. Um, Thanks for the clarity. Okay, that, thank great. you. Others to that item? Okay, thank you very much. Any other items? Okay, I don't think I have any items as well. So I'm, are we prepared for calling of the question? I'm going to do so. All those in favor? Any opposed? That motion is carried. Thank you, Council. The next item, our presentation of, are we moving to bylaws? We are moving to bylaws. Thank you, Madam Clerk. It's been moved by Councillor King, and I'm looking for a seconder, Councillor Durley. Thank you. Be it resolved, the Council of the Town of Pelham, having given due consideration of the following bylaws, do now read a first, second, and third time and pass, and do pass the same, and that Mayor and Clerk be in or hereby authorized to sign and seal the bylaw. Being bylaw 3641, being a bylaw to authorize the Mayor and Clerk to enter into an encroachment agreement with Robert Trempier, how do you say the name? Trepenier. Trepenier and Katrina Trepenier, owners of 350 Kilman Road. Maybe the clerk can elaborate on the, the necessity for this bylaw. Certainly for you, Mr. Mayor. The uh, a previous council had entered into an agreement with the former owner of this property to um, allow a driveway access over a portion of a road allowance. And uh, this it was written into the agreement that should the property change owners, the agreement would then be amended to reflect that uh, change in ownership. So that's uh, basically what the bylaw is for. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments? That's for so Percy. This, this is an unopened road allowance? That's correct. Okay. Anything else? There being none, I call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? That motion is carried. It's been moved by Councillor Papp, second by Councillor Durley. Be it resolved, following bylaw be read a first, second, and third time and pass, being a bylaw 3642, being a bylaw to adopt, ratify, and confirm the proceedings with Council. Well, the Town of Pelham is regular meeting held today, the fourth day of August, 2015. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion carried. It's been moved by Councillor Durley, seconded by Councillor King. Be it resolved this regular meeting of the Council be adjourned until the next regular meeting scheduled for Monday, August 24th, 2015, unless sooner called by the Mayor. Uh, normally we'd meet on the 17th, but that is the time for the Association of Municipalities of Ontario conference in Niagara Falls this year, and uh, so it's been postponed until the 24th of August. We're going to call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? That motion is carried. This meeting is adjourned. Does Council want to continue, or do you want to take a brief break? Keep going, or are we able to keep... Just because it's found in two different places on our website, Mr.